and um, good evening. Welcome to Gulf Coast Creation Care, our conversation with Ben Rains. We're so glad you could join us this evening. A couple of housekeeping um, items before Ben gets started. Um, we have 65 people signed up for this event, and um, the format is going to be Ben is going to uh, share a presentation with us initially, and then there'll be a question, question and answer session afterward. We ask that you mute yourselves, um, particularly during Ben's uh, presentation, and then uh, afterward, uh, just unmute yourself to speak. Um, we do have three of Ben's books to give away to uh, participants this evening, and we're going to be very generous and tell you all that um, because we didn't realize that uh, President Biden was going to be speaking this evening. And so if anybody absolutely feels like they have to uh, go watch uh, President Biden's speech, as long as you are here signed in at the beginning of the event, um, you are eligible to receive one of our three books. Great. I'll see you later. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> Um, we do ask you to use the chat box if you want to um, put a question in there to ask Ben uh, when he's finished with his presentation. Feel free to use the chat box for that. And um, also, for those of you not familiar with Zoom, if you want to see Ben full screen and not the zillion people that are signed on, um, if up in the right hand corner, there's a little something you can uh, click called view and you can choose speaker view and that way you'll have um, a, a, a wider view of Ben as he's speaking to us, if you want to do that. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Ben. Ben Rains is an environmental journalist, filmmaker and naturalist. In 2019, it was announced that he had discovered the long lost wreck of the Clotilda, the last ship to bring enslaved Africans to the United States. He found the ship in the heart of Mobile Tensaw Delta, the area featured in this book. He wrote and directed The Underwater Forest, an award-winning documentary about the exploration of a 70,000 year old cypress forest found off the Alabama coast. He also wrote and produced the documentary America's Amazon, which aired on PBS stations around the country. His underwater film work has appeared in documentaries on the Discovery Channel and National Geographic TV. A former newspaper reporter, Rains has also co-authored several scientific papers published in paleontology journals. He is a graduate of New York University's Tisch School of the Arts with a degree in filmmaking, and he is a licensed charter captain leading adventure tours in the Mobile, Mobile Tensaw Delta and to Alabama's Barrier Islands. He lives with his wife in Fairhope, Alabama. Welcome, Ben. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Um, I see a lot of familiar names there and, and uh, faces, which is fun. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about the book. Afterward, I'm happy to answer questions, including about the Clotilda. Um, I know a lot of people want to hear about that, um, and some things are afoot with that. Um, but the um, I'm going to talk mostly about Alabama and um, why it's such a special place um, and sort of the, um, the things that are threatening that as we speak. Um, I don't know if you noticed or saw it recently, but the head of our state environmental agency wrote an op-ed uh, for AL.com attacking the book and me, um, arguing that uh, the air and the water in Alabama were cleaner than they were in the 80s. Um, I would not argue with that, but they are not necessarily where they could be or should be uh, as we continue to be the state that spends the least to protect our environment. <laughs> so if if that fellow uh, Lance LaFour wants to um, go head to head, I'm ready. I'm, I'm happy to. I like Lance. But the notion that we are doing all we can for our state from a, um, you know, legislative perspective is just ridiculous. <laughs> Um, as we sit here debating whether or not Alabama Power should pull the coal ash out of all of its ash ponds spread all over the state. Um, of course they should, but we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, hopefully, mostly this talk is going to be fun. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we're going to watch, we're going to see a lot of pictures and I'm going to talk uh, pretty fast, hopefully not too fast and move through a lot of stuff. So here we go. Um, 
Oh, we're on the wrong slide already. Here we go, full screen. All right, so a few nods. Are we seeing uh, Saving America's Amazon on the screen? Okay, excellent. It's always a little disconcerting to do these Zoom talks because you never you never know if people are uh, in, interested or <laughs> amused. <laughs> um, so this picture is up in the Mobile Tensaw Delta. We've got a couple hundred thousand acres of bottomland forests and wetlands. It is uh, the largest, one of the largest contiguous wetland uh, complexes in the United States. It's pretty extraordinary. Um, and it's the most diverse uh, river system in North America, which is really incredible. As, as Scott Duncan, who I was talking to a minute ago, pointed out in his book, this was barely known um, until quite recently, um, less than 20 years ago. So in this picture, you see a bunch of uh, greenery and the brown water, but I wanna direct your uh, attention quickly to the top of the picture where you see that kind of bunch of sticks up there. That is a yellow crowned night heron nest. You see these all over in the Delta. They're really messy nests um, and they're always over the water, which I think is just fascinating from an evolutionary standpoint, because um, this first flight for these birds is, you know, they better hit it. They better do it right because you hit that water. There are a lot of alligators. Um, uh oh, let's see. Hmm. Ah, there we go. All right. I was not unable to make my screen switch. So this is the cover of the book, Saving America's Amazon, came out December 15th. I am thrilled to say um, the first printing sold out almost immediately, which really says a lot about uh, how we as Alabamians feel about our state, but, but also uh, across the country. Um, we're well into the second printing, which is great. And I can kind of gauge interest um, in Alabama based on uh, the charters I book. You know, I'm booking a lot. I'm booking people from Seattle, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York. They're coming to Alabama to see this place we're talking about. You know, even if we don't recognize what we have here, people around the country are recognizing that this is this uh, almost uh, unheralded jewel and we should be so thrilled to have it. So the name of this talk used to be um, learning to love ourselves or how to break the habit of landscape pornography, which I'll explain a little bit further in a minute. Right now we are in Fairhope looking at a Chinese cherry tree with a beautiful sulfur butterfly on it. This is another beautiful tree. This is a Chinese princess tree. Uh, these are growing all over the state now. They're about hundred feet tall, covered in these beautiful white blossoms. Uh, they're becoming quite uh, a nuisance. You're seeing them more and more. This particular one is in Daphne, Alabama. Um, it, you know, a little bee flying in, quite fun. Anybody recognize this? That's right, our old friend kudzu which is one of the things many people in America would use uh, as a word to describe Alabama. Now, those of us who live here know we only really see kudzu along, kudzu along the roads where there's a lot of sun and stuff, but it is one of the defining things in the national mind, along with a lot of other things we don't want, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, this is beautiful wisteria. This is actually the Asian variety native to Japan and China. Um, it is about to start blooming all around us. I want you to do a little homework experiment when you're out. When you see the wisteria start blooming, notice if it has leaves or not. If it doesn't, it's the Asian variety. I guarantee you almost every bit of it you see is gonna be this Asian variety and not this, our native wisteria, which is gorgeous, beautiful, smells incredible. It's almost impossible to find. In fact, the only places I find it are deep in the swamp uh, where the Asian variety has not yet penetrated. And then this is our state flower, a camellia, a beautiful one. This one's in my backyard. Um, bought it at Bobby Green's nursery. It's quite pretty. Uh, native to Korea, China, and Japan. Uh, why, you might ask, is that our state flower? Well, that really gets at the heart of what my book is about, what I'm talking about, and the message I want to try and share with you. Um, this award was given to the Weeks Bay Foundation, which I used to be the executive director of. Um, when they were named the state's best environmental group. You notice it's the Alabama Wildlife Federation and it's the Governor's Conservation Achievement Award. Why then, you might ask, does it have a mountain goat on it? Is an excellent question, as mountain goats only live in the areas in red, primarily in Canada. We have a few little outcroppings in, in, in the United States, but you notice they're a long way from Alabama. So why would the governor give out this award with this, you know, mountain goat on it? It just, I, I, I couldn't get over it when I stared at it because we have so many animals you could put on there, like a bobcat. This is a cute little bobcat up in the Delta. 
an alligator if you want something even more dangerous than a bobcat uh, or a rabbit, you know, like this. This is one of our, our uh, cane cutter rabbits. We have these giant rabbits in the swamp. Um, they're about, they push 20 pounds. This particular one was stuck on this log for almost six weeks uh, during the flood time. When the Delta floods, all the uh, animals, terrestrial animals, have to climb up trees and find somewhere dry because the entire swamp, you know, 10 miles across, goes underwater for months at a time, just like the Amazon or the Nile with their annual flooding. Really cool. And if a rabbit can live on a tree for two months, you know, that's pretty impressive. I actually went back and visited this rabbit several times. It was uh, two winters ago and brought him food and stuff. Just off camera here, off out of the frame, you can't see, but he had a very tidy little pile of poop where he kept pooping in the same spot, stuck on his log. Um, now they're actually excellent swimmers, these, these big cane cutter rabbits, but the water was 55 degrees and moving at about four or five miles an hour. And he was not looking to get off that, um, that, that log, no matter what I did. Or we could have one of these. This is a handsome blue-eyed meadow katydid. That is its full common name, <laughs> but it's gorgeous. Look at the colors. I mean, what a spectacular bug. Think how much more interesting that would be than that white mountain goat on the statue. But this is Alabama, just like the kudzu. Alabama in the minds of the national public, cotton fields, steel mills, and civil rights protests. But those are all things we've done to Alabama or things we've done in Alabama. They're not this incredible landscape that is here all around us, which we're only just beginning to celebrate. So this is one of my favorite places on earth. For the last 20 years, I have been uh, lucky enough to spend a lot of my hours, um, working hours out here in this gigantic swamp. And it is spectacular. Um, one of the things I love about this picture, it's an infrared picture where you see red you are seeing people, you are seeing the hand of man, but look how much of the picture is blue, green, and purple. Uh, that's where you won't find anybody. Now, if I can get my cursor, no, I can't get my cursor. All right, in the center of the picture, on the left side, you see a big orange mass. Um, that is the Berry steam plant. That is Alabama's uh, power plant in the Delta. And that uh, bend right below the orange mass is the coal ash pond. And part of the orange mass is the coal ash pond. That's what is being talked about right now. That is 21 million tons of coal ash sitting there in that bend in the river with about a 20 foot high dirt wall around it. The wall almost breached a few years ago. We had floods three years ago, I think, almost overtopped it. And after the floods, you could see huge sections of the walls where they had to go out and rebuild it. and and. Um, re-carpet it with grass and reinforcement stuff. Alabama Power's own predictions say that if, they, if the dam failed, 21 million ton, tons of coal ash would spread all the way across the Mobile Tensaw Delta. Now imagine that for a second. We are talking about smothering the, most, the, the end of the most diverse river system in the United States under a killing layer of coal ash. That's incredible. I'm not gonna go on about this, but March 30th, I think, or 31st, there's a hearing in Sarah Land where the State Environmental Agency is going to hear thoughts about this. I encourage you to sign up. You can do it online uh, to make comments. It is ridiculous that Alabama Power should be allowed to keep the coal ash there forever. Um, we are in an era of rising sea levels, increasingly powerful storms. There is no argument you can make that it makes sense to keep 21 million tons of coal ash in an active floodplain that floods every year. It's just absurd. So we're gonna move on into the beautiful parts of where we live. This picture was taken right about this time uh, a few years ago in Little Batty in the, in the heart of the lower Delta. You know, this is the estuary where, right where freshwater grasses and things give way to saltwater grasses. And you see all these iris and you think, oh wow, look at all the iris. Now, New Orleans, for instance, and Louisiana have the, the fleur de lis, the iris, as their symbol. Um, I will submit to you that they have stolen our iris. And it's ridiculous that we let this happen, but it happened a long time ago. When uh, the French settled French Louisiana, Mobile was the capital. And they were here in our swamps when they saw the iris and they adopted it as their symbol because they recognized it from home. There are iris all over France, all over the rivers. Uh, Monet, 
painted iris, Van Gogh painted iris. Joan of Arc carried a battle flag with an iris on it into battle. So somehow, uh, when Louisiana retreated and New Orleans became kind of the heart of it, they stole this Alabama iris and took it with them. But that Florida de lis you see in Louisiana is actually an Alabama iris. Here's, here's a uh, female ruby-throated hummingbird nectaring at one. Um, we'll see a male in a minute. These, these iris, you can go up in the Delta this time of year and stare out over 30 acres of these things blooming in these meadows. It's a stunning sight. Uh, this is a, a um, an egret. Incidentally, um, people often ask me, what's the difference between an egret and a heron? There's one difference. All the white herons are called egrets, and that's it. Uh, anatomically, they're very similar to, uh, anyway, um, and it's standing in front of the lotus. Um, now, the, those shower pod looking things you see, those are the seed pods of the lotus, and then the yellow flowers like this, which are huge. These flowers are bigger than your face. Now, we're talking about state flowers. I would argue that this would make a spectacular one. And look how many there are in the distance. You can drive along the river for a mile in different places and see just this huge sweeping bank of these lotus blooming. The flowers last one day and then the petals fall off and that seed pod grows. So look behind the main flower here and see how many there are bobbing in the breeze. These things, the bloom is stunning and, and just incredible. Um, the only difference in the Asian lotus and, or, and our lotus is theirs are pink. Um, so Homer's lotus, you know, the, the lotus eaters, they would have been eating pink lotus. Our yellow ones are delicious. You can eat every part. I don't encourage you to go eat our lotus, but they are really good. Now, this is uh, a regular sized guy. Uh, some of you may know him, Hunter Nichols, standing next to the last giant cypress in the Delta. This tree is 32 feet around. It is a redwood sized tree. This is what our Delta used to look like. And we have lost that perspective because the Delta has been cut over going back to the 1800s. They've cut the trees. They would float them out at high water during those floods I talked about to the mills. But when we investigated the underwater forest, the stumps out there, a lot of them are 10 feet in diameter. They're the size of this tree. So imagine this swamp was this land of giant trees. And it, it, it's almost impossible to get you know, grasp that when you see what's there today. Um, but that's kind of a lot of what's happened in Alabama. We have lost perspective on what was here and is in many cases still here. But in the 17 and 1800s, Alabama was a place people from around the world came to, to see things you couldn't see anywhere else. And I would like to get us back there. Uh, now this is the male ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, I'm gonna show a couple of birds here just because you know, part of what's so cool about our river system is it is a highway from the Gulf of Mexico and Mobile Bay all the way up to the top of the state. Birds can follow these river corridors and migrate into the center of the United States following these same rivers. It is a migration throughway. Now, this little bird has come from South America or Central America, but imagine for a second, this thing weighs about the same as two pennies and is able to fly across the ocean. Not only that, with tagging these birds and catching them in nets and stuff, we have learned that the same bird will pass through the same backyard within two or three days of when it passed through the year before. Staggering, just incredible. This is an indigo bunting. If you've never been to the bird banding events on Fort Morgan or Dauphin Island, I encourage you to go. You can actually hold the birds. They'll let you release them sometimes. It's a really incredible way to kind of get close to this nature and see it. Um, here you're seeing a bunch of those indigo buntings out in the woods. And now we are looking out across a vast expanse of grass on the causeway. Um, we always hear about the Everglades as this river of grass. Well, we have that here. Just like we have areas of standing cypress in the water like the Okefenokee, all these famous swamps you've heard about, they're all here in our swamp. They're all here in our delta. Um, we, we have sawgrass, just like the Everglades, dozens of grass species, really incredible system. And then there's this productivity. So the rivers flow down from all over the state and they are a highway for nutrients, carrying energy downstream from the top of the state to the bottom. Uh, and we see that in the fish people catch and the landscapes or seascapes rather that surround us down here. Now, how many of you have been to Dauphin Island? Would you imagine I took this picture on Dauphin Island? No, you wouldn't because you see that brown water. But what you get, when you get below the water and can actually see what's there, it's staggering and it's, it's 
beautiful. These are tidewater silver sides. They are swimming around the rocks at the end of, of uh, Fort Gaines there on the east end of Dauphin Island. Uh, these are shrimp. These are larval shrimp caught in February. Um, that's a regular size pencil. These shrimp are going to be five inches long by June when shrimp season opens. Now think of what it takes for a shrimp to go from smaller than a grain of rice to five inches long and as big as your index finger in a few months. Incredible energy moving through here. These are uh, baby uh, speckled trout. You see the seagrass around them. They were caught in a seagrass meadow. I wanna talk a little bit about seagrasses. I want you to go home with one idea in particular. Alabama has already lost 50% of its seagrasses. 50% of the area we had that was seagrass meadows in the 1950s is now bare bottom because we have already killed more than half of the seagrasses in the state of Alabama, which is our most important nursery habitat without question. Uh, these are anchovies uh, swimming again. These are over uh, Perdido Pass. Um, I just put this picture here because I want people to understand the incredibly productive area we are in. The portion of the Gulf of Mexico from the mouth of Mobile Bay to the mouth of the Mississippi River is called the Fertile Fisheries Crescent. It is considered the most productive part of the Gulf of Mexico, which is one of the most productive marine environments in the world. So we have this incredible system here powered by our rivers. And uh, if we don't take care, we're going to lose it, which I will talk about as we go on. This is a dwarf um, seahorse. Uh, this is full grown. This is an adult. It's about an inch and a half long. They mate for life. When I caught this seahorse, its tail was actually wrapped around the tail of its mate. Um, this, this is a male. It's pregnant. You can see its protruding belly. In seahorses and some of the other uh, pipefish family, the males have babies. But you know, most people who, who come to Alabama wouldn't imagine we have seahorses like that. This is a little grass shrimp. Um, he's carrying its eggs. She rather is carrying her eggs. These are some mangrove snapper caught in a grass bed in Grand Bay. The one on the bottom is two weeks old. The one on the top is about two months old. You can see that growth curve I'm talking about in our productive waters. This is a Molly Miller Blenny on a uh, gas platform in the mouth of Mobile Bay. <laughs> the platforms are actually kind of like coral reefs. They're covered in barnacles and encrusting organisms and things. And these little blennies move into them. But what a fun little fish face. I just love that little, little guy. And here we're looking at one of our pitcher plant bogs. Um, Alabama is home to about nine species of pitcher plants, which are carnivorous plants. And then we have about a dozen more carnivorous species along with them. Um, the tall white flutes you see there, those are the leaves of the pitcher plant. That The red things on stalks with the balls, those are the flowers of the pitcher plants. But what we're talking about here are plants that eat meat. It's actually quite incredible. We have um, nine species of pitchers, as I mentioned, which in a geographic area the size of Alabama is, is uh, ranks among the highest in the world for an area this size to have that many species. Those little pink flowers you see over to the left and scattered around are orchids. Uh, we have quite a few orchid species, which I'll talk about. Um, this is a praying mantis hanging on a pitcher plant. And this is a pitcher plant cut open so you can see the bugs that it has eaten. You see, these are mostly love bugs. Right below my thumb, you can see a little beetle. If you go down a little further toward the bottom, you can see a ladybug in there. These are bugs that have fallen for the pitcher plant's tricks. One of its tricks, it has a scented, it produces a nectar around the lip of the big bowl, which attracts uh, flies and other bugs and things. Um, and then it also has the rotting smell coming from these bugs inside, which, which attracts uh, more things. They, they fly down in the plant hoping to find these goodies, and then they get bamboozled by that white hood, the thing that, that hangs over, you can see in the pictures down below. Um, and that it, it, it acts like stained glass. So if you're in the picture looking up and you see that white hood, it glows against the sunlight and is the brightest thing you can see. The way bug eyes work, they'll fly into that bright thing over and over thinking that's the way out until they get exhausted and fall back in and end up like this stuck inside, which is a miserable place to be. That liquid smells terrible. Uh, this is a sundew, another of our carnivorous plants. Um, the, the little globules that you see there are actually gooey and sticky like honey which is how the plant catches the bugs it eats. Here's a crane fly caught in a sundew. You can see the globules are all over it. It is not gonna get out. It's just gonna wiggle and get further tangled until it dies. And then it's gonna decay right on top of the plant and all its nutrients are gonna feed the plant. Here is a big dragonfly that was caught. You can see an ant there on its head. There's actually another ant in its body. 
Um, sundews are so powerful and sticky. If you get uh, even a small bird could get trapped in one. Quite extraordinary. This is a green link spider. Um, this, this spider actually hunts wasps and bees and hornets. It's about the size of a banana spider. So we're talking about like a four and a half, five inch spread of the legs. This is a huge spider. But imagine a spider that attacks hornets and it just pounces on them. It doesn't even use a web. I watched it kill this bee, uh, which I, it may be a big carpenter bee or something. Um, the minute it bit it, within seconds, the bee was incapacitated and quit moving. Really, really cool. Incidentally, the lynx spider can spit venom um, and actually uh, cause irritation and even temporary blindness in people. Um, so don't get too close to one. This is a hummingbird hawk moth. We have a moth that uh, nectars on flowers like a hummingbird. Its wings are a blur and it unfurls that little neck. How cool is that? And this is Gandalf. Um, this is uh, actually a fellow named Steve Heath, who was once the chief marine biologist for the state. He's retired now and has become part of a group I call the Bog Men, and they go around and, and try and uh, take care of different pitcher plant bogs and protect them. Um, what you're looking at in the foreground is the white fringed orchid. This is a beautiful orchid. We actually have 54 orchid species in Alabama, which is a stunning number of orchid species. Um, the white fringed is now, I believe, known only from this spot along Fish River. Uh, there used to be another spot they called the Popeye's Bog. There was a pitcher plant bog next to a Popeye's fried chicken along I-65, and they paved it to uh, make a parking lot for a hotel. So the, that site of white fringed orchids is gone, and that is happening again and again all over Alabama. In fact, this spot where this orchid is growing was all grown up and covered in privet and other junky stuff until the property owner decided to bulldoze it to build a house. Well, cleared out about three acres, gonna put a big house there. The neighbors got mad and called the Corps of Engineers. Actually, they called this guy, Steve Heath, and they called, um, I saw Patrick Harper's name in the list there. Uh, they called Randy Roach, who both live near this site on Fish River and uh, reported them. And those two guys called the Corps of Engineers who came out and, and discovered that the bulldozing had happened in a wetland. So this battle is going on between the property owner who's trying to get to build a house and not get in trouble and the Corps fighting to protect the wetland. While they're fighting, pitcher plants came up all over the three acres. And then 20 of these orchids came up. So all of a sudden these plants that haven't grown or bloomed here in decades because they've been covered up and not gotten any sun pop up. So the property owner ended up donating the land to the Weeks Bay Foundation to get out of trouble. The Weeks Bay Foundation has now managed this bog for about 20 years. The first year there were 20 of these orchids. The next year there were 40, then there were 80. Last year there were 1,560. And all that happened is we cleared the brush off a piece of land and left it alone. You know, these landscapes are still here waiting for us to get out of their way. Here's another one of our orchids. Look at this thing. It looks like you could go buy it at Home Depot. It's gorgeous. Who would imagine we had flowers like that here in Alabama? And if you knew we did, why would you make our state flower a camellia? Here's another little orchid. This little tiny tree frog is going to jump onto it. You know, we, this is a snake mouth orchid. This is the green fly orchid. This lives up in the top of live oak trees. Um, if you happen to be in a place like Blakely uh, State Park after a storm and you find a live oak limb on the ground, go look around. You'll probably find this little orchid. It blooms in about May, really cool. Who would have thought we had 55, 54 orchid species? All right, now we're in the Red Hills, which is an area I absolutely love. The Red Hills are actually old coral reefs that date back millions of years. The reefs are the hills and the hollows in between them are where sediments washed away because there wasn't a hard coral ridge in there. So this has become one of the um, neatest uh, frontiers of science in America, uh, as far as I'm concerned, because of oak trees. Um, I'd always been told that the Great Smoky National Park was likely the center of global oak oak tree diversity because they had 15 species of oaks in the park boundaries and this was supposed to be stunning. Well about four years ago a group of scientists found 20 species of oak trees on a single hillside in the Red Hills blowing away oak tree diversity anywhere else on the planet. The Red Hills are now considered the global center of oak tree diversity. Now when I say that it just sounds kind of you know but think about that. 
there's nowhere on earth with more species of oak trees in a small area than this little spot in Alabama. Uh, there are native azaleas there. This is the Red Hills azalea. This is another of our native azaleas. These would make great state flowers. This is the Atasca lily, another candidate. The big leaf magnolia. How spectacular, a flower two feet across, blooming all over the Red Hills. We have mountain laurel all the way down here. This is the furthest south you can find mountain laurel in the United States, I believe, and it's in the Delta because it's always been here. Back to the ice ages, when the rest of the country was frozen, all these plants you find in the Appalachians were hunkered down in the Mobile Tensaw Delta area, hiding from the frost. And after, and all of our river systems, because Alabama didn't freeze. So Alabama was this refuge for plants that you now find all over the Eastern United States because they spread back up the spine of the Appalachians. Really cool. This is the Red Hill Salamander. And it is like a duck-billed platypus. And I bring this up because it gets at why Alabama has so many unique species. Um, we are now, thanks to Scott, we know that we have just jumped up in the rankings from the state, uh, the, the fifth most diverse state with the most species to the fourth most diverse state. Um, Scott did the count. We are now 84 species behind Arizona and gaining on them fast. When I started working on this book, uh, we had 354 fish species. We now have 450. We had 84 crawfish species. We now have 97. So uh, new things are being discovered here all the time. Now, when I said a duckbill platypus, what I mean is this salamander has no living relatives. It is an evolutionary dead end. It lives in the Red Hills because it can live nowhere else. It's never spread anywhere because it has to, it makes uh, caves in the coral formations, the old that underlie the Red Hills. Um, it's fossorial, it lives underground. And it's big, giant salamander, about uh, 12 inches long. Incidentally, there is an Alabama Red Hill salamander in the um, Cincinnati Zoo. It has been there since 1978, uh, which is pretty incredible. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, when you're thinking about being old, imagine this salamander is over 40 years old. It has lived on a diet of six crickets a day for all that time, proving that things in Alabama are very tough. Uh, and then there are fish. I just mentioned we had 450 fish species. To put that in perspective, California, which is the, the top of the uh, diversity ladder in the United States, has 110 freshwater fish species. We have 450. New York State, which is considered one of the most diverse states for its fish uh, assemblage, has 165. We have 450. Now we're quickly going to look at a bunch of darters here. Um, this is uh, the red fin darter, I believe. Um, we have 77 darter species. These are little minnows that live in tiny riffly creeks. Now look at the colors in these darters as we go past. They have wonderful names like the lipstick darter, the holiday darter, the Johnny darter, the turquoise darter. They're spectacular. And look how different they are from one another. Just incredible. And this is all because we've never been frozen. Our, everything that has ever evolved in Alabama, unless we've killed it, is still here which is incredible. Now I said, unless we've killed it, we are number one in many things. Number one in fish, number one in mussels, number one in snails, uh, number one in turtles for our river system. We are also number one in extinctions. More than half of the extinctions in the continental US since the 1850s have happened in Alabama. We have more extinctions than Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, and Louisiana put together. This is not a good thing. And I would tell Mr. LaFleur of ADEM that uh, we, we are losing species as fast as we're gaining them in some measure. And we cannot go on being number one in extinctions and number one in diversity. So we have to make a choice. I'm with diversity. And this is a little shiner. These next six fish I caught in one riffle on a little stream alongside uh, Highway 225. Excuse me, I have to take a drink. Look at these fish. This is a little chub, just glowing red and pink. This is a long ear sunfish. Look at the colors on this thing. And this is a rainbow shiner. Natropus. This is an incredible little fish. This guy is about an inch long. We've spent all this money and uh, raising neon tetras in our aquariums from the Amazon. 
for my money, this is way cooler looking than a neon tetra. Look at them in the water. These are, this is in a stream. They glow like these turquoise jewels, just incredible looking fish in their spawning colors. This is uh, a blue nose shiner found only in Baldwin County, Alabama. Look at those fins, gorgeous. And then this is the rusty grave digger. This is uh, one of our 97 crawfish species. This one, I um, had a little bit of a, a role in its um, rediscovery. Uh, I was gonna do a story about the different kinds of crawfish I would catch in the Delta and eat. And I was gonna you know, write a newspaper article about it. So I'm looking up the species I might catch. I noticed this one on the list of species in this county. And it says it's only been found one time in 1978. Um, <clears throat> so I decided I would go looking for it. I called Fish and Wildlife and they said, oh, we're almost sure that's extinct. The reason they said that is because the only place it had ever been found was in Doe Leaf Creek, immediately next to the sewage outfall for the city of Daphne, Alabama, next to a Home Depot and Interstate 10. So they said, we, we're just sure it's gone. I went to look anyway. It took three weeks, but I finally caught one. This was cause for great celebration. Um, it meant the species wasn't extinct. There were some crawfish scientists writing a book called The Crayfishes of Alabama for the state who were in uh, Indiana and uh, Iowa, I believe, who flew down to go to this swamp with me next to the sewage plant to try and catch one. We caught seven the first day. They had better technique than I did. And then we went and looked in the next stream down the bay to see if they were there. And they weren't because the city of Daphne had bulldozed the entire length of the stream. <clears throat> they had um, gotten a permit using hurricane recovery money from Hurricane Katrina to turn the creek into a drainage basin, basically. Turns out they didn't have permission to do that. It was illegal. I wrote some stories about that. They got in a lot of trouble. They had to give back the $2 million they had gotten to destroy the stream and then pay $2 million to rebuild the stream. But the rusty grave digger was no longer there. The scientists kept looking. We worked our way down the bay. Uh, we worked our way all the way to Florida, finding these guys all over the place. It turns out they were all over and always had been, but nobody had ever looked. That's what's happening in Alabama again and again. There are species all around us that are disappearing before we even knew they were there. Now, you know, you hear about these high diversity counts in places like New York that have been known a long time, and it's because they had so many research universities there with so many biologists being trained who were out hunting for stuff. Well, that happened all over California, all over the Northeast. That's only beginning to happen here now with biology professors like Scott training a whole new generation of scientists who are discovering these things at a record pace. It's really incredible. Um, this is the red swamp devil. Uh, that's the crawfish we, we eat. This is the hole of one. Um, I put this in there because look at the size of that hole. These things get up to 13 inches long. Imagine a 13 inch crawfish. That's a lobster. It's just really <laughs> incredible that we have creatures like that. And this is a stink pot turtle. Uh, this was caught down near my house. Um, we have quite the, the turtle collection. In fact, it's the best in the world. The uh, Mobile River system has more turtle species than any other river system on earth. Now think about that for a minute, more than any other on earth, more than the Mekong, more than the Nile, more than the Amazon. Our river system, which runs from the very top of the state, all the rivers that flow into Mobile Bay, and we're talking about the Cahaba, the Tallapoosa, the Coosa, you name it, Black Warrior, all the rivers that flow downhill to here make up the most diverse turtle population on earth. That's just incredible. But we are under threat all the time from all sorts of weird assaults beyond things we would think about like uh, chemical factories and stuff like this. What you're seeing here is called laurel wilt. You see all the bare branches in the front and then all those trees with the wilted brown leaves. These are red bay trees. trees. Red bay is one of the most common trees in our uh, swamps and it's that way all along the coast everywhere, they are all dying. We are witnessing an extinction level event happening to this tree species right now. Uh, it, they're being killed by a little beetle that came in packing crates from Asia. Um, our particular infestation is believed to have started in Pascagoula and spread this way. But about four years ago, you go out in the swamp and every red bay you saw was in the process of dying. They're not coming back. Um, 
Now, the same disease affects other members of the laurel family, including sassafras, which is where we get root beer and filet powder for gumbo, um, and avocados. The Florida avocado farmers are terrified of this disease, so it might steal guacamole as well. Um, and then the spice bush. And this is probably the saddest part of this whole story uh, because we, the spice bush swallowtail butterfly is going to go extinct because of this beetle. Uh, we have eight species of swallowtail butterflies, you know, the big tiger swallowtail, and then the spice bush swallowtail. And the only thing it lays eggs on is, is the spice bush, just like monarchs will only use milkweed. So we are gonna lose this butterfly because of this beetle. Uh, but there are bright spots. These are, um, and, and I, I, I've got to talk to my fish and wildlife folks, <laughs> these are tulatoma snails being released into the wild um, that were raised in um, the hatchery, as I understand it. This is the first mollusk in the history of the United States to be pulled off the endangered species list, to be moved up to a level of less concern. Um, and it's a really cool story. Um, we have lost many, many, many species of mussels and snails to extinction. And it's because of how we've treated our rivers. Our rivers are dammed and channelized and turned to industry. Um, they are the most diverse rivers in the country, but they are also pack mules for industry. And one of the effects of that has been industry has been allowed to use all the water, um, regardless of the damage to the environment. And that is changing. These, these licenses they have are, have been challenged in court and court victories have happened so much so that uh, the utilities are now being forced to allow the rivers to maintain a minimum flow, which keeps oxygen, keeps things from dying. This is all good news. But how precarious things are came home to all of us about three years ago when we had a little drought. It, just, it was a quick drought. It wasn't even that long, three or four weeks. But during that drought, rivers all over the state went dry. Um, and they went dry because industry and, and other users of the rivers in Alabama are granted the right to water. They are not granted the right to a certain amount of water. They are granted unlimited rights to the water. So they can suck every last drop out of a river, regardless of the environmental impacts. I, I don't know um, if any other states allow use of rivers like that. I know Georgia does not, for sure. But what that meant, the Cahaba River ceased flowing. Um, it only, this is, this is an incredibly diverse river. The Cahaba River has more species of fish, even though it's only 150 miles long, it has more species of fish than the entire state of California. So this incredibly diverse river went dry, quit running, and only started flowing again downstream of the city of Trussville's sewage outfall. So imagine that, one of the most diverse rivers in the United States, the entire flow was the sewage outfall from a city. And we let that happen in Alabama because we don't have a water plan. It's ridiculous. Now people say, who cares if a snail goes extinct? Well, first, just look at them. These are gorgeous. Look at how different they are. We have 150 some snail species, the most anywhere on earth in a geographic area this size. The only way I can really bring home uh, the importance of the loss of a species is to talk about our marshes, where we have the marsh periwinkle, which is a little snail about the size of the end of your thumb. And if you go out in a marsh, you will see them on almost every blade of marsh grass, working their way up and down as the tide rises and falls. If you take that little snail out of that marsh, that marsh will die. The reason it'll die is because the snail is forever eating algae off the marsh grass. If the snail is not there to eat the algae, the algae covers the grass, the grass can't photosynthesize and it dies. So something as tiny as a marble sized snail can be the keystone species that controls an entire environment. So when we say we have lost more species to extinction, we have no idea what problems we may have caused. You know, we look at our muscles, these muscles this is the wash tub muscle. They're as big as a plate or as a tray at McDonald's. They're huge, they live a hundred years or more. But we have been altering our rivers since the 1800s. This is 1882 uh, on the Tennessee River. This map is showing how they're going to build locks to get around the mussels at Muscle Shoals. Um, we began altering our rivers for industry back then. It's, it's, it's sort of staggering to think of the changes we have wrought. Um, people used to write about the Black Warrior River being so clear in the 1800s that you could see the bottom in 20 feet. Now you can't see the bottom in two feet. 
And it's because we've lost all these muscles. Part of the reason we've lost them is because our rivers are so dammed up. We have more than 30 dams on our major rivers. We have 150 some mussel species, 11 of them can live in rivers. You know, this dam, uh, this is one of the turbines that lay dam, this gave my grandparents electricity. Um, but we have not done what we need to do. Out west, they have dams and they build fish ladders to get their migrating fish around them. You know, we, we have buried places like this. Clear Creek Falls is now 60 feet underwater in Smith Lake. This was a 60 foot high double waterfall. You know, the landscapes we have buried are gone forever. They're not coming back. They were beautiful, but we have lost something else. We have lost this incredible connection from the mountains of Alabama to the sea. And it was fish like this. This is a Gulf sturgeon, uh, 348 pounds. This was caught in Centerville, Alabama. It was the largest freshwater fish ever caught at the time. These things used to migrate all the way up these rivers, up past Birmingham. Uh, people used to cast net mullet around Birmingham and the Cahaba River because they migrated up these rivers. We, when, when the year man first walked on the moon was when we put in the final dams on Miller's Ferry and Claiborne blocking off the Alabama River from the Gulf of Mexico. Fish could come upstream about 90 miles and that was the end. They used to, for, for millions of years, make the trip 300 miles inland on our rivers. We had about 16 species of fish that did this. Now none of them can make the trip. Uh, this is a paddlefish. These migrate all the way up to Missouri. Its nose is rubbed raw from rubbing against the dam trying to find a way around it. This is a paddlefish whose nose has been knocked entirely off. We were electroshocking at the dam, trying to uh, document fish species that were trying to go upstream. And we're 90 miles inland. We actually found flounder, saltwater fish, 90 miles inland. Incredible. But these fish can't make it past the dams. Now, when I wrote about this uh, 15 years ago, we were opening the dams four times a day just to let fish through. They called it conservation locking. And then recreational boaters could go through anytime they wanted in bass boats or whatever. Now we are opening the dams once a day for conservation locking, and they will only let boats go through once in the morning and once in the afternoon. We've gone from opening these locks 10, 15 years ago, a couple dozen times a day to opening them twice a day now. This is not progress. And you can see the lack of progress all over the state coming to bear down in Mobile Bay. These are flounder caught in a jubilee. Now, Daphne, Alabama calls itself the Jubilee City, celebrating this rare phenomenon, which is sea creatures in the middle of the night on summer nights rushing toward the shore. And you can go out and spear flounder, you can scoop up shrimp, crabs, they're lethargic, they barely move, you can load up on seafood. But this is not a cause for jubilation. This is a warning call. This is a low oxygen event where there's no oxygen in the water. And so the sea creatures are trying to get out of the water. They're trying to find some oxygen. They're right at the water's edge where the tiny little bit of waves might make enough oxygen to survive this event. These are becoming more common year by year. What's really worrisome, until five years ago, Jubilees were solely confined to the eastern shore of Mobile Bay. Now, every summer, we're having them on the western shore of Mobile Bay as well. What this means is our dead zones are getting bigger, just like the Gulf of Mexico dead zone. We have dead zones in Mobile Bay every summer now, and they're coming from all the nutrients coming in from the top of the state. Now, when I say nutrients, you know, that's a good thing in some contexts, but too much of a good thing is a bad thing. We're talking about fertilizers and, um, you know, nitrogen coming out of detergents, all kinds of stuff coming down. And this is our case study. In 2009, we had a cold, wet winter. As spring came, every fish species in Mobile Bay suddenly had lesions on it. Redfish, uh, speckled trout like you see here, sheephead, mullet, flounder, white trout, uh, mohara, all these species were caught with these lesions. The state had no idea what was going on. They put out the first ever do not consume fish from Mobile Bay order. Now this is one of the largest bays in the United States and the state had to tell people not to eat the fish because all the fish were sick. When it was finally solved, uh, Auburn University uh, figured out that we had had such a wet winter that it flushed, that occurred, the rain occurred just right after all the farmers put pesticides on their fields so many pesticides flushed down into Mobile Bay that they destroyed the slime coating on the fish in the bay and made them all sick. Now, if that's not 
the ultimate warning sign. I don't know what is, you know, we killed the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I lived up in Maryland in the 80s and it's never recovered. Uh, if you go to Maryland, the state motto there is Maryland is for crabs. If you go to a crab restaurant in Maryland, you're eating crabs from Alabama and Louisiana. We ship our crabs and our oysters to Maryland and Virginia to their crab houses and play because they don't have anything left to pick because they're in such dire straits. Now this picture is um, Dog River in Alabama after a rainstorm a few years back. Uh, a reader brought it to my attention that this happened every time it rained. So I started going out and taking pictures every time it rained and putting them on the front page of the paper. Uh, this caught the attention of the mayor of Mobile who came to the newsroom and singled me out. And he came up to my desk and he said, Mr. Rains, you're embarrassing the city. And I said, yes, sir, Mr. Mayor, I'm gonna do it every time it rains until you fix the problem. Now, all this stuff you see is coming off Interstate 10 and Interstate 65 and all the streets of downtown Mobile, which drain into Dog River. The people on Dog River had bought a litter trap, a huge device designed to catch garbage coming into the river. The city of Mobile for years had been refusing to send garbage men out to collect the garbage coming off their streets and into the river. So I kept writing about this. What really stunned me was the mayor wasn't mad about the garbage. He was mad I was telling people about it. And that has been the attitude in Alabama for so long. This is a picture of Mobile Bay in 1976 taken by uh, the Skylab space station. And you are seeing an incredible moment of destruction here. That huge plume of mud on the upper right side of the bay is coming out of the Lake Forest subdivision, which at the time was the largest subdivision ever built in the United States. Construction went on for about 10 years. So much mud flowed out of this subdivision that it filled in Doleve Bay, which had been 10 feet deep prior to the construction of the subdivision. Um, it is now one foot deep. There are no seagrasses, there is no life in Doleve Bay compared to what there used to be. <clears throat> now that plume of mud you see going down the shoreline killed all the seagrasses on the eastern shore of Mobile Bay. If you talk to people who grew up on Mobile Bay in the 60s into the 70s, they will talk about there being seagrass everywhere along the shore of the bay from the very top all the way to Fort Morgan. Now there is no seagrass period. It has never come back. This construction project killed all of it. And mud remains one of the most destructive things we do to our waterways. Uh, this is mud coming off of an Alabama Department of Transportation construction site. ADEM was there supervising, giving them a check off every week for following all the environmental rules, none of which they were following. Um, but we have another issue in our state, which is timber. Um, we are the number three timber state in the country after Oregon and Georgia. Uh, in Oregon, they have a law that you are not allowed to cut trees on your property within 25 feet of the high water mark of any stream. Now, this does several things. One, it makes a 25 foot buffer between the stream and um, the clear cut, which stops mud as it flows in. It hits that buffer where there's still leaves and trees and things, and it stops the mud from flowing in. It also makes sure there's a canopy over the water of trees to shade the water, keep it from overheating and getting too hot. And then trees can fall in and make snags, which provide habitat and all that. We don't have a rule like that in Alabama. Instead, what we have is a recommendation. The state recommends that property owners do not cut more than 50% of the trees up to the water's edge. However, you are allowed to cut every single tree up to the water's edge, which is what you see in Alabama again and again. If you were to ask me what's the best thing, the single thing we could do that would help uh, our waters, I would tell you we need a timber law. And I would say we should use the BP oil money to buy that 25 foot buffer around every stream in the state from the property owners, pay them for those trees they can't harvest and protect our rivers forever. This is a stream next to a car dealership in Mobile, uh, or rather in, in Baldwin County. And I've seen the exact same thing in Birmingham. This stream, before they built this parking lot, that 17 acres of pavement, before they built that, this stream was six inches below the forest floor. Within a year, it was 11 feet below the forest floor. All the rain that used to fall on that 17 acres of forest was shunted into a storm water system and hit this stream like a fire hose and just ate the banks away. This happened on Shades Creek in Birmingham. This has happened all over the state. Um, 
we we have so many problems in our streams. This is that little riffle where I showed you those six beautiful species I caught. This is Three Mile Creek in Mobile. I know which one I like better. And um, that's that's all I got. So I'm happy to take questions from anybody. Hey, Ben, I'll start. What are the, um, you mentioned that we are the now the fourth um, state for diversity. Right. And Arizona, you said, is right above us. Who are the other two? Yeah, um, uh, Texas and California. Um, and we just knocked off New Mexico from the list. And we're okay. coming from Arizona, for Arizona. As Scott calculated, we have 84 species to go. As I mentioned, during the time I wrote this book, we, we got well over 100 new species. So, um, and, and, you know, look out, California. We're coming for you, too. <laughs> so the Actually, next this is, thing is, is what do we do about it? Um, what do we do about which? Well, you, you, you named a lot of problems with the diversity, et cetera. Is there, something, is there something we can do about any of it? Oh, gosh, there's so many things we can do. Number one is to start caring and um, start uh, uh, acting the way you see people in other states act, caring about the area around us and um, embracing the tools we have to, to, to fight for uh, the natural world around us. You know, one of the things, Alabama has always been about 20 years behind um, the times in the envir environmental movement around the country. You see that all the time. For instance, Mobile, a city of close to 400,000 people does not do curbside recycling. I have been unable to find any city close to that size that does not offer curbside recycling. And, you know, you see what's ended up in our rivers. Um, I mean, it's, it's, you know, you can see it right there. So, you know, for a long time, I worked at the newspaper and the newspaper was the environment's best friend all over the nation. But um, that relationship is, is no longer because um, when the budget cuts came down, the environment was one of the first things to get, uh, you know, chased away. So the public no longer has a really good venue to uh, call and say, hey, I saw somebody dumping a barrel of crap in the river. So what they're left with now are the environmental groups and we need to empower our environmental groups to uh, take up that fight. And when I say empower, what I mean is support them um, because they are our voice now. And you know, people say, well, I belong to Mobile Baykeeper or I belong to the Alabama Coastal Foundation or Sierra Club or the Weeks Bay Foundation, which changed its name to SALT. Um, that's great, but you need to not belong to one, you need to belong to all of them because that's how they gain currency and voice. Um, and, and, you know, when, when an environmental group goes to the Capitol to talk, um, they are representing their members, but the politicians, if they've got 10 environmental groups there and each one of them has thousands of members, they don't know that, that it's the same thousand people joining each group. Uh, the important thing is to have for our environmental groups to have friends, um, so that they are speaking with a loud voice and that's, what's up to us. You know, we have to help them with that. And it's, it's happening. When I moved here 20 years ago, Mobile Bay Keeper had one employee. The Alabama Coastal Foundation had one employee. Um, Mobile Bay Keeper has 15 now. The Coastal Foundation has 11. And that means that people are contributing and the budgets are growing. So we're doing better and we need to keep doing that. Uh, to avoid us talking over each other, I am going to um, ask uh, the questions that are in the chat room. Oh, all right. There we go. Uh, yeah. so, uh, Mary Sheffield wants to know if it's possible for us to put in the fish ladders like they have in other states into our uh, lock system. Um, anything's possible, but it's not going to happen in Alabama. Um, you know, I, I, if you ask me, I don't think it's going to happen in Alabama. Um, we could we could do a pretty good approximation of that though with a rigorous program opening those locks every day. Um, you know, fish are very attracted to the moving water. If you do something as simple as run a garden hose into the lock for an hour before you open it, that attracts the the fish in there. Mm -hmm. uh, we see this happening in in um, other states like in Georgia, for instance. Um, if you want to see an Alabama shad, which is a shad species named for our state which is almost totally wiped out of Alabama, you have to go to Georgia because they're opening their locks and the fish are migrating and spawning over there. Um, so I, I don't think it's realistic to think we're gonna remove the dams or drain the lakes. 
um, there is a whole ecosystem, and I mean an economic ecosystem built up around those lakes with the bass fishing tournaments, recreational homes and all that. Uh, so we've got to work with what we've got. And to me, that means opening those uh, locks as often as possible. And, you know, they're making electricity at the dams. It's not like it's going to cost them anything. <laughs> gotcha. I see that Raul Richardson has his hand up. Go ahead, um, Raul. I'll ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, Ben. What's up, man? Hello, Raul. Good How you to feeling, see you, buddy. I'm good. I'm good. Hey, I, I got a real simple ask, man. Those pictures, and I know I've seen them before from when I first discovered Alabama's Amazon. Uh, I'm just hoping that you might share some of them with me because I want to put them up in my home, <laughs> especially some of those uh, of the 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 bog plants and flowers and the carnivorous plants and certainly the hummingbirds wouldn't hurt, but those orchids particularly, okay? Right, aren't they incredible? And so once you deliver the flowers to me, I'm gonna have you over for uh, some libations to yeah. see how I mounted them, okay? Yeah, all right, all right. Deal? But you can come out in the bog and take your own pictures. It, it's all around us. Man, you know what? We can do that. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I'm ready. It's about all to be right, done. Buddy. You bet. <laughs> Ben, you said that you uh, might tell us a little bit about what's new with the Clotilda. Uh, can, sure. you, can you talk about that for just a minute? Yes. So um, the Clotilda remains uh, underwater and buried mostly in the mud. Um, I remain a staunch advocate for digging it up and putting it on display. Um, the state has pledged a million dollars um, to, toward that effort. It's probably going to cost 10 to $11 million. So we have not made a lot of progress um, with, with digging it up yet. Um, however, we have broken ground on the new Heritage House Museum in Africatown, which is going to be the first modern museum dedicated to the Clotilda story in history, which is great. Um, I think we need a bigger museum and I'm, I'm hoping that they will do that um, because you know, I, I have a book on the Clotilda coming out um, and it's an incredible story. Uh, you know, and from, from the start back in the 1800s to today, it's an incredible story and it's a story that's still unfolding. But, you know, we here have in, in, in Africatown, we have all the entire slavery story um, in one unit. You know, people, Roots was fantastic and everyone loved it, but a lot of Roots was fabricated. With the Clotilda story, that's not the case because we know everything there is to know. You know, we know where these people were captured. We know the villages they came from. We know when they were captured. We know who captured them. We know where they were sold, how much was paid for them. We know the ship they were on. We know who bought them. We know where they were enslaved. And we know where they were they, when they were freed. And we know where their descendants are today. You know, this is an incredible American story. And it is the proxy for the story of African-Americans whose ancestors arrived here enslaved in chains because they don't know their story. They, that was stolen from them. Um, with some DNA work, they can begin to get a hint of where they may have come from. But the story of what happened to these people is the story that happened to all of their ancestors um, from the Middle Passage, the slavery experience, and then, and then freedom. And um, you know, we have an opportunity to tell this global story here unlike anywhere else, um, to me, digging the ship up is, is the highest priority that the, uh, when, when they were announcing, the day they announced that this was the Clotilda, they also suggested that maybe the best thing to do would be a memorial like Pearl Harbor, leaving the ship in the mud in this remote swamp. Um, I would tell you, I've been to the African American History Museum in Smithsonian. They have a piece of a slave ship there. It's about the size of a brick. It is from a slave ship from South Africa that sank in a harbor in um, Brazil. There are only 13 slave ships ever found in history out of 20,000 ships that were in the global slave trade. And the Clotilda is the only one that, that brought enslaved people to America. How could we not dig it up? I mean, it's just only in Alabama would this even be a debate or a discussion. Um, so, you know, chastise everyone you know who has anything to do with this story and encourage them to dig up this incredibly important, internationally significant shipwreck. 
I would like to second that thought, Ben. Um, I moved down here from Kansas City several years ago. And if you're ever in Kansas City, I highly recommend that you visit the Steam, Steamboat Arabia Museum. It's a steamboat that sunk in the Missouri River and was excavated. It was remained under a cornfield for many, many years and was excavated. Have you seen it? No, no, no. Oh, it is the most absolutely fantastic museum you have ever seen. And so I know from having that frame of reference, what a wonderful um, thing that could be if we excavated that boat. And I'm going to ask you a question from Barbara Cadell. Um, she says, what are our chances of having an Alabama state water plan? And Barbara, I'll just, before Ben um, answers, I'll tell you that I know from being married to um, a scientist who works at the Mobile Bay National Estuary Program that the, uh, the NEP is doing with BP oil money comprehensive watershed management plans for every watershed in Mobile and Baldwin County. Um, but I'm interested in Ben's thoughts on if it will ever extend beyond that. Well, the, the, the NEP watershed plans are great, but they're not really relevant to the discussion about a statewide water plan um, because usage is the issue. And um, in Alabama, if you're given the rights to water, you have the rights to water. And we see it all around us. Um, if you drive around Mobile and Baldwin County, you see the sod farms everywhere. Uh, you will see them sprinkling massive fields with gigantic, you know, quarter mile long uh, sprinklers while it's pouring rain because it doesn't cost them anything. Uh, they have those things set on a timer and they water the fields every day at the same time. Who cares if it's raining? It's free water. Well, I care because now uh, the Magnolia River is no longer clear and it's no longer clear because the springs no longer pump and the springs no longer pump because we're sucking all the water out of the aquifer and spraying it on these fields um, for no reason other than laziness. So that goes on all over the state. Um, we have been lucky because we have been sparsely populated and have a lot of water, um, underground water and rain that falls on the state. But more and more people are moving here. The climate's getting hotter. That's not going to work any longer. What we need is a plan like Georgia has, which when uh, they enter drought conditions, industries get less water. It's legal. It's in the legal framework. They know. The industries can plan for it. Um, and, you know, we industries don't need to waste water the way the, the grass farmers are. Wholesome, the cement plant in Mobile, um, captures all the rainwater that falls on that property. And that's what they use for their process water. They do not use any water out of a, the, the tap or a, a water source or underground. They are catching rainwater and making cement with that. Incredible, and they should be applauded for it. That is not what the state is encouraging. Um, industry is fighting a water plan. And you know, in Alabama, our state is run by industry. Um, I, I don't know of any more explicit thing I could say than when, um, I discovered that the uh, Alabama Department of Environmental Management Management Commission was run by a woman who was also the head of the Alabama Business Council. Um, that is not, you know, the fox guarding the hen house. That is the fox pretending to be the hen. And, and you know, it's just um, so the NEP plans are great for this area. But really, they're not even enough for Mobile Bay because the biggest problems in Mobile Bay come from Birmingham and Montgomery and Huntsville coming downhill. Um, so we have a long way to go with the water plan. There's one that's been in the works for, I don't know, six, seven years that's just never gone anywhere because that's just what happens. Um, so people need to get really mad and start kicking and screaming and joining the environmental groups. And it'll probably take some more droughts where we have to show that you know, these incredibly diverse rivers are being reduced to the flow from sewage plants. And we probably have to show that on, on a national level to get people in our own state to do something about it. Um, I mean, it's terrible, but often embarrassing people is the best way to get something done. Yeah, certainly um, when it comes to water, everything is connected. And so, uh, and obviously we're downstream and uh, so whatever we do down here is good, but it's affected by everything in the watershed above us. You're absolutely right. And so we can only hope that someday Alabama will get on board. 
Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat box for you, Ben, and I'm going to ask Ran if he um, knows of anything else that needs to be asked, and if not, we'll close. You got to unmute, Rand. <laughs> it looks like he... Laura asked a couple of good questions. One, she wanted to know what, what camera you were using to get those beautiful underwater shots. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, those were actually taken with a very inexpensive Canon. Um, that is, uh, the, those were the G15, I think, which is their top of the line point and shoot, you know, has a one lens that's a zoom. Um, I, I've upgraded a little bit, but um, it's amazing what you can do with um, a digital camera these days. And that's a great camera, don't misunderstand me. Um, but uh, it's really all about light, you know, um, and being in the right place in the right time. Um, so anybody that wants to get into digital photography, I, I think the first thing you have to do is learn how to operate the camera manually, um, like you would an old film camera, um, where you take control of all the settings. If you let the camera dictate everything, you'll get, you know, a, usually a pretty good result. But if you really want things to, to become alive, you need to shoot raw, uh, where you're getting the most data possible. So you need to buy a camera that can shoot raw, which is just a lot more data than a normal picture, like a, a normal JPEG. So if I take a picture with my camera on RAW, that picture might be 50, um, uh, you know, like 50 to 100 megabytes. And if I take the same picture not on RAW, it might be 10. Um, so it's just a ton more data. And then you learn to manipulate light. Um, so if you know how to work, uh, you know, if you knew how to work your Nikon back in the 80s, <laughs> Uh, that's all. everything you need to know. You just have to figure out the digital interface. Thank you, Ben. Um, I think that we are going to ask you to give us five numbers um, between one and 34. And those five numbers, uh, the top three that you give us are going to uh, get the three of our books. And we're asking you to pick five numbers in case somebody that okay. we draw doesn't need it or something like that, so. All right, well, I love late arrivals, so let's go with 34 and uh, 18, um, seven, 15, and 28. Awesome. So we will be in touch with whoever. Um... Oh, we don't get to find out. No. <laughs> Well, Lella, do you want to um, come on and let us know? I certainly can. Let me switch over to the, uh, they're actually not in order of arrival. They're in order of first name. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, the top three are Yolanda Gottfried, um, Martha Jane Cassidy, and Janet Buckley. And if for some reason those three already have a book and they don't want one, we will go to 15 and 28 later. Okay. Excellent. Um, ben, thank you so much sure. for um, what you do for our world and for our um, region specifically. Um, we love you. And um, thank you much, so much for doing this event for us tonight. We appreciate sure, it. Sure. I'm happy to. Um, and I'll just throw out there, I am uh, starting up my charter business again. Um, I take my first trip in a year next week. Um, I've already booked pretty much all the days in April, but um, May and June are, are uh, open. If you wanna go out in the Delta with me, it's a lot of fun. Um, you can find me on Facebook. Oh, if I'd showed the last slide, it had my email address on it. I forgot to do that. Um, so yeah. anyway, um, what is if you, the you, name of your business, Ben, well, it's, uh, America's Amazon adventures. Uh, and I have a website. If you go look there, you can find that. Um, but I do trips out to the barrier islands and trips, different trips at the Delta. Um, and you know what, what I mentioned before, that's so cool. is all these people from other States, uh, and they're booking three and four days. They're coming to see this place we live in. That's just, you know, wow. That's um, 
the LA Times ran the entire first chapter of the book. Who would have thought California would be wanting to read about Alabama like that? Uh, it's just really cool. Wonderful. Everybody have a wonderful evening. Thank you for joining us. All right, thank you all. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. That's great. That's really great.